boss themes from The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker are the best of the series. I'm not just saying that. Try to hum the music from the big black teeth monster boss fight in Skyward Sword. See? You can't, even though you had to do that like 12 times in the game. But now... Oh! There's something special about these six boss themes. Composer Hajime Wakai, one of Nintendo's veteran composers, has always had this way of writing music that simultaneously feels perfectly natural and completely bizarre. His work on Wind Waker's boss themes harnesses a ton of musical chaos, but hangs it all on these rock-solid melodic structures that keep everything together, ending up with fantastic tracks that feel cathartic and intense while still having this great melodic sense about them. For reference, let's look at the boss music from Ocarina of Time. We get a fast driving rhythm in the snare drum and a low pounding piano part that plays a hectic line that sort of evokes an E minor sound, but all of the chromatic movement obscures exactly what kind of tonality it's going for. Some very dissonant, wandering brass parts float in over top, further obscuring any sense of key and refusing to go where you might expect them to. All of this together creates this feeling like you're going insane while you listen to it. It's a great vibe, very dark and it gets at that butt-clenching feeling the game is going for when you find yourself up against an enormous beast. But rather than washing the whole music over with this aggressive dark rhythm and dissonance, Wind Waker's boss themes tend to make choices that are more strange than dissonant. Goma's theme from Wind Waker's Fire Temple hits us hard right from the beginning, with each beat alternating bass notes and big brass hits to give the feeling of a great lumbering beast. It's not as quick, or as dissonant, or as relentless as Ocarina of Time's boss music, but it does feel just as aggressive, and the way the brass and strings move up and down chromatically, respectively, introduces some of that same chaotic energy. Both themes feel perfectly fitting for a boss fight, but the biggest difference between the two is that Ocarina of Times is trying to lose the listener, while Goma's theme is trying to make sure you can follow along. The brass melody in Ocarina of Times' boss theme was designed to feel completely unpredictable, shifting keys and rhythms to keep you from ever being able to tell what was coming next. Goma's theme gives us a lot to grab onto right at the beginning. The way the brass runs up to emphasize these three strong beats makes this part feel like a distinct and recognizable motif, and the way it repeats note for note gives the music a chance to stick in the listener's head, and that is why, as we keep moving through the piece, it becomes so disorienting when the music starts to unravel a bit. The following phrase moves from our key of pretty much F minor to a G flat augmented chord the sharp 5th and natural 9th creating a dissonant tritone interval on top, while the bass leaps up from the root to the sharp 4th for a different dissonant tritone interval on the bottom. This moves to a G7 sharp 11 flat 9 chord next, the melody outlining the same D to A flat tritone while the bass outlines another new tritone between G and C sharp. The melody here is centered around these jarring tritone intervals too, and really hammers home this feeling of what the hell is going on. But not in the same kind of atonal, oppressive way we saw from Ocarina of Time. As the piece develops, the small 16th note jabs at the end of each main motif become their own motif that keeps the piece together. 
The tritone bass leaps under this tritone heavy G flat to G section are a clear transformation of this same idea, and the last eight bars of the loop throw this idea back and forth between different voices as we shift between different tonalities. The music is always meandering around to new strange places, but this motif keeps everything feeling like an extension of the same thought, rather than a chaotic barrage of notes. That last big chord buildup just kills me. I guess it's technically a G flat sharp 11 flat 9. Decadent. If we look at A Link to the Past, the game that set the musical tone for the franchise, the boss music feels pretty quaint by comparison. Like the Ocarina of Time theme, we have a driving snare part underneath a repeated figure that uses chromatic notes to introduce dissonance into the music. Specifically here, we have the main A5 chord, shifting up to the flat 2 and down to the raised 7th. It's not to the same degree as Ocarina of Time's boss music, but we're getting at the same kind of feeling, a pounding, relentless intensity. In a minor key, using the flat second and raised seventh are perfect choices to inject some of this threatening dissonance into your music. Kale Demos, the boss for Wind Waker's Forest Dungeon, uses these exact two notes as part of the main motif of its theme too. The basses give us this motif hitting the root, 7th, and flat 2nd of our tonic B minor chord in this short, short, long pattern, once again repeating the figure to cement it in your mind in a very melodic way. Now, if this were a Link to the Past boss theme, it would probably continue like this. That's kind of what the structure of the melody and the general conventions of boss music would predict, but this is not what we actually get. Instead of a simple 4-bar phrase in 4-4 time, this theme stretches that last bar into 2 bars of 3, and the melody shifts into outlining a D-sharp diminished sound while the vibraphone comes in with this little flittering chromatic line on top. This spirals into a new 4-bar phrase where the flutes and pizzicato strings veer around a descending line that follows basically no harmonic sense whatsoever. This music isn't pounding or relentless or even that dark. It's not afraid to pull the basses out completely for this answering phrase, but again, getting strung along like this, we get this feeling of, wait, what the hell is going on? This sense of confusion is balanced out by the motivic consistency that gives us something to hold on to as we take this ride. These random high notes follow no logic of key or chord, but they do follow the rhythm and melodic contour of the last part of the main melodic phrase, and so it feels like an extension and development of the initial idea instead of feeling completely random. Although we do get the emotional effect of randomness from the individual note-to-note -note choices and dissonant leaps between them. This is brilliantly riding the line between coherence and confusion to get at a totally different kind of butt-clenching feeling than the feeling of butt-clenching that our other Zelda examples were shooting for. In both of these Wind Waker examples, we see the melody contain two ideas. The main idea, and then a second idea that's used to wrap up the melodic phrase, one that seems almost like an afterthought. In both cases, though, it's this easily overlooked secondary idea that's used to feed the musical developments that follow, becoming a huge part of the DNA of the piece by the time it's over. This trend continues with the theme for the Helmarok King, which pushes the strangeness to the limit while justifying it with rhythmic structure. 
The melody is full of eyebrow-raising moves, like starting on the major seventh, moving down to the flat seventh, or moving from this fifth to the flat fifth before diving down to the root just to sneak a tritone jump in there. Not to mention the harmony shifting from alternating D sus and D minor chords to an E flat minor major seven chord, and then to alternating E sus and C sharp sus chords. The key of the piece is completely up in the air. But the whole thing is tied together with a super solid melodic rhythm. This figure, with two sixteenth notes running into a quarter note triplet, isn't the kind of rhythm that you hear very often, so it stands out, and repeating it as much as this melody does hammers it into your head. If we break down each four bar phrase, we can see that we get this one bar rhythmic statement, and then a repetition of the same rhythm with new notes, and then a two bar long variation of the same idea that trades out the quarter note triplet rhythm for rising eighth notes leading into this final flourish, that secondary afterthought type idea I mentioned. This one maintains a relationship to the main melody by keeping this rhythm of two sixteenth notes running into an accented beat. Like the other examples, this fourth bar becomes its own separate idea that develops throughout the piece. This wild transition figure between sections feels like a barrage of notes, but the top part is based on the rhythm of that fourth bar figure outlining a chromatic descent from D to B. The inner string part that fills in the rhythmic space left by the top line with these chromatically descending tritone intervals is what makes this feel so hectic. The two lines combining together to make a series of chords that make no real sense. Ending on a C minor major 7 chord as a way to get back to D is absolutely insane, but it totally works. The next main section of melody, the most headbanging part of the song, sees the whole ensemble coming together to blast out these big spread major triads in a new 6-4 time signature, all of a sudden in the key of F-sharp major. If you look closely at the second half of the melody, you'll see these two rising eighth notes leading into a held B major chord. It's stretched out from sixteenth notes to eighth notes and shifted down a whole step, but this is the exact same figure as in the last bar of the previous melody. It's the sort of thing you'd never notice as a casual listener, but that subconsciously affects how you hear the piece. It makes everything feel like one coherent piece of music in spite of the frantic key shifting and unorthodox melodic choices. Jalhala, the Earth Temple boss, isn't quite as liberal with his note choices as this last example, but he certainly balances dissonance with a sense of melodicism in the same way. The general vibe of the piece is chaotic, as we feel right from the start with this busy 16th note xylophone part and chromatically sliding accordion chord stabs. The xylophone part follows a two beat pattern, crossing over the bar line to loop every two bars of 3-4 time, and the notes used in both this pattern and the accordion part are the root, fifth, and major seventh of our tonic B minor. These notes are played as a cluster, with the root and seventh a semitone apart from each other, and then the accordion lowers these two notes both by a semitone for a different cluster chord in the middle that is absolutely atrocious. You don't often see the flat seventh and major seventh used over a chord at the same time. Try to explain that one with a music theory principle other than I tried to make it sound gross. The melody hinges on these little rhythmic chirps, these repeated notes kicking off each melodic phrase and also sounding off in the breaks between melodic phrases, penetrating the chaos of the surrounding instruments every couple of bars. The melody here is pretty simple. 
After these memorable 16th note chirps, it flings itself up to the tonic B an octave higher with this decorated B minor arpeggio, and then it walks down the B minor scale back to the lower B note. Once again, these two basic melodic ideas, the initial rhythm on beats 1 and 2 being the first and the smoother scalar motion being the second, are developed in the tune's B section, although the order is flipped from how we first heard them. The B section starts off with the horn taking a longer, more fluid melody line that basically decorates a B minor triad with scalar motion. This accompaniment breaks into a new rhythmic feel, accenting beats 1 and the end of 2, while the bass opens up with 8th note lines that wander up and back down to the root every 2 bars. Note the chromatic descent from the raised 6th to the flat 6th to the 5th in the melody, as well as the use of the flat 6th and flat 2nd in the bass part. Refusing to stick to a standard scale or modal sound, let alone make sure that your layers aren't using clashing seconds, adds a type of discomfort to the music that we're really not used to. It's not a discomfort of the sort we heard in the Ocarina of Time boss theme, with lots of pounding, jagged dissonances, but more of a sense of confusion as these different layers refuse to quite fit together nicely. After this phrase, we get back into a choppy rhythmic feel, with the melody using that initial chirpy rhythm but breaking it out of its loyalty to beats 1 and 2 of the measure, and pairing it with these huge leaps outlining a C major 7 sound. This is the flat 2 chord of the key. The bass rhythm shifts too, pounding out each beat, and this, combined with the harmony switching chords for the first point in the piece, helps to delineate these two phrases as a call and response between the smooth and mournful horn and the erratic and mischievous oboe. Each boss theme feels so different from the others, and captures the personality of the specific boss it's written for beautifully. These chirping rhythms and cheeky dissonances give Jalhalla's theme a goofy element mixed in with the chaos that's just perfect for a big, fat, roly-poly ghost monster. If we're talking about melodic structure though, we have to bring up what is definitely the most popular of these boss themes. Mulgara's theme's bouncy and singable melody is made up of two motivic parts, this super strong and recognizable rhythmic bit dancing down the minor scale, and this strong conclusive figure giving us straight eighth notes leading up to our tonic E. The first idea dances around the second of the key, and the second idea gives a clear resolution to our tonic, creating a nice satisfying push and pull between them. The melody starts off with two bar long phrases built from these two ideas, but moves into one bar phrases moving that first rhythmic idea down the E minor scale, before concluding the larger eight bar phrase with one final return to the second resolving idea. Structurally, this melody is bulletproof. It reminds me of a limerick structure where shorter repeated phrases are woven into the larger pattern to give some momentum that leads towards a satisfying conclusion. The first time through the melody we have only percussive accompaniment, but as the arrangement builds up in intensity, more and more counterlines come in and flesh out the harmony. These string stabs and horn pads that come in give us F-sharp and C-sharp notes to make the tonic E minor chord into an E minor 6-9 chord, giving the harmony a sharper edge. The bass walks up the minor scale from E minor to B minor underneath this melody, squeezing the flat 2 chord F between our home E minor and the F-sharp minor chord that follows. This flat 2 chord foreshadows our move into the following section. The initial bouncy melodic idea is taken and stretched out, keeping the recognizable rhythm but altering the contour of the line and extending it into a 4 bar phrase that shifts between flat 2 and 1 chords.
These little interjecting tin whistle phrases are super fun, and wouldn't you know it, they set up a new melodic idea in the following section. As we begin our build towards the piece's climax, a new melody comes in that takes the basic rhythmic idea from those interjections, an eighth note followed by two sixteenth notes, and stretches it out into a longer phrase running up the A minor scale. As we move higher and higher in range, the piece's initial melodic ideas are reintroduced and flipped around, with the second resolving idea used to lead into that first bouncy rhythmic idea, culminating in this massive five chord at the end of the phrase. Just when we expect a resolution, though, the rug is completely pulled out from under the arrangement and we're left back with just percussion underscoring these held super high whole notes in the strings. The bottom part moves down chromatically from the fourth of the key to the flat second, sitting on this flat two for the last four bars before our opening fanfare brings us back to the start of the loop. I love the way this tune takes such a gradual build to a climax and then immediately snatches that climax from us, stripping the piece down to bare bones and breaking out of the key with the sinking chromatic part. There is just so much going on in this piece. It's so deep and meticulously crafted. There's no wonder that of all these great boss themes, Mulgara's is commonly viewed as the standout. If you're looking at the runtime of this video and growing pale at the thought that I might conclude this video without talking about the last of the game's six boss themes, I have good news and bad news for you. The bad news is that I am going to conclude this video without touching on the last boss theme, but the good news is the reason why I'm doing so. There was just so much to talk about in this last theme that I've decided to cut out his section and turn it into its own full video. Please be excited for a deep dive into Godan's boss theme coming in early April 2024. As great as all Zelda boss music is, Wind Waker's boss themes are really something special. They have a completely unique sonic aesthetic compared against the rest of the series. Rather than going for maximum dissonance, they have a controlled chaos that stays relatively light to match the aesthetic of the game while still capturing that mixture of anxiety-inducing and exhilarating that makes it so fun to take on the challenge of a final boss. Taking care to create a distinct rhythmic identity for each piece and craft a rock-solid structure for each gives them all room to experiment with chaos in the other musical elements. As always, thank you all so much for watching. Full transcriptions of these boss themes will be available on my Patreon for $5 and up supporters, and I'll see you all in the next one.